Uh, Klaas Knopp joins us, president of the uh, Netherlands Central Bank. Good to see you. Thank you for joining My us. To be um, here. Steve used that phrase, a game of chicken, and it does feel at times that the market has a different view of where rates are going to top out to you more hawkish central bankers. Now, who's going to win this? Because when you look at the current data, I mean, Germany's final GDP, uh, CPI for December, negative 0.8% for December, even though the year on year was still high. Inflation's coming down, isn't it? Haven't we seen the peak already? Can't you guys take your foot off the brake at this point? Well, first of all, I would not cast this discussion in who wins or loses. We, will, we have a mandate to take care of, and we will do what is necessary to achieve our mandate. You already mentioned that at our December meeting, our president announced that, ra uh, that rates would still have to rise significantly to levels that were sufficiently restrictive to ensure a timely return of inflation to 2%. The current situation is not satisfactory in that respect. And what we've seen thus far is data that has not been encouraging from our end. We've seen one more inflation reading where there was no signs of abating of underlying inflationary pressures. So we have to do what we will have to do. And core inflation has not yet turned the corner in the euro area. And that means that the sort of market developments that I've seen over the, let's say, last two weeks or, or so, are not entirely welcome from my perspective. I don't think that they are compatible, actually, with a uh, timely return of inflation toward 2%. So, uh, in your opinion, there are a lot of investors out there who are playing uh, on the motorway and, and taking their chances when perhaps they should be um, less complacent and a bit more conservative. That would be your message. Well, we have to do what we have to do, but our president has already announced that most of the ground that we, st that we have to cover, we will cover at a constant pace of multiple 50 basis points hikes. And that's, well, we can be as clear as we have to be on that. And, uh, and if I was a market participant, I would take our words so, quite so, seriously. So that's 50 uh, in February, 50 in March. Well, I mean, where that sort of pace of 50 basis points hikes is going to end, I cannot say beforehand. But it is very clear that our president has used the plural S in her wordings. I am using the plural S here. So it will not stop uh, after a single 50 basis point hike. That's for sure. What about the risk of inflation, as a big problem, recession on the back of everything that's happening and this tightening cycle as well? We're seeing a lot of companies very, very concerned, despite the fact that actually they're retaining workforce because they don't want to lose people and then have to rehire them uh, later on in the year when things don't look as bad. So in terms of the recession watch at the moment, where do you see us panning out, class? Well, we've seen a significant slowdown of growth in the second half of, uh, of last year and then also an increasing likelihood of uh, a recession. Now, I would say whether we are going to have a recession in the euro area or not, it's too close to call. It could be a recession, it could not be a recession. But I think the more relevant factor for us is that we're probably looking into a year of slow growth. And we're looking into a year of slow growth also because there will be very little room for policy support. There will be no room for support from monetary policy. There will be little, if any, room for support from fiscal policy. Luckily, our labour markets are still very tight. Mm -hmm. So, yes, the labour hoarding that you refer to, I very much recognise. That's also what employers are telling me. Yeah. They would be crazy to lay off workers and those who did during the pandemic very much regret having done so. So I'm optimistic that that will keep demand going. But the economy will have to refine its own growth engines going into 23-24. So... I take on board everything you said there. We're potentially, it's going to be a near-run thing on the, whether we have a recession or not. But we're going to have higher rates. We've established that. We're going to have less monetary support elsewhere and less fiscal support as well. That is going to expose, and I think I'm using your words here, the weakest links in Europe as well. Um, are we still right to be concerned about Italy? Or actually, do we look at the markets and think, do you know what, the, the, the spreads above Bunds look pretty narrow at the moment compared to where we would think that they could be if Italy was in trouble as well. Are we being a bit complacent about the weakest links in Europe? Well, I mean, from a financial stability perspective, of course, high levels of indebtedness are a, a continuous vulnerability. That's true for private indebtedness in some countries like mine. 
it's true for public indebtedness in countries like Italy. But I would say that thus far, huh, the market has taken sort of the policy signals coming out of Italy on fiscal policy, on having a very responsible fiscal policy quite seriously. And I think the market, therefore, huh, for the right reason, has had confidence in sort of the sustainability of, of the current uh, spreads and the current market well, pricing. What qualifies for fiscal responsibility these days? I mean, we had Mr Gentiloni here yesterday, who's at some stage desperately trying to get round to the, the, the change of the fiscal rules, the growth and stability pact, to justify these extraordinarily high debt levels. What, what qualifies for fiscal responsibility? 150% debt to GDP? 4% deficit? Well, that sustainability is not so much about uh, just looking at the sheer level of debt to GDP. It is about the level of growth you, uh, you manage to create to actually uh, create the debt repayment capacity. In that respect, a lot is happening at the moment. Italy is profiting from the NGEU funds. The NGEU funds, as you know, come with conditions, come with reforms. These reforms should pay off. And if these reforms lead to a structurally higher level of productivity growth uh, in the Italian economy, then even 150% public debt is sustainable. But of course, it will have to come down. On that, there can be no doubt about it. The period of sort of ratcheting up public debt levels has to come to an end. And also the success of the reform of the fiscal rules in Europe, we will have to measure it uh, in terms of the decline in public debt ratios because that can be the only objective. But to pick up on, on Steve's point, we, we just spoke to Valdis Dombrovskis, who said that part of the response to the IRA in the United States could be more fundraising, potentially, to try and make European renewable energy businesses more competitive uh, uh, with the United States. I mean, uh, that sounds like it should be a non-starter as far as you're concerned. Well, those, uh, if that leads to an intensification of uh, fiscal, uh, fiscal um, sort of expenditures, then I do think that they have to be compensated elsewhere uh, in the budget because there is no room for large-scale uh, fiscal uh, expansion. And by the way, if there were to be large-scale fiscal expansion with an economy that is already at the brink of its capacity, it would be inflationary again it would enlarge our inflation problem. And as I already indicated, there is absolutely no starting point for us to ease up on inflation. If we look at the energy-related uh, data that's coming in at the moment, it is clear that um, the wholesale prices are falling in Europe as well as other parts of the world here. And that has been a, a major component in the burst of inflation that we've experienced in Europe. If that continues to come down or stabilise, do you think actually you may have got your maths wrong on the inflation estimates that the ECB has been making? Because I think we've all been surprised about how quickly those numbers seem to be falling. Yeah, there's a lot of ifs in, in your question. The only thing that I see falling thus far is energy price inflation, and that is well anticipated. We knew that we would not have similarly high eh, extra additional inflation uh, rates in energy inflation this year on top of what we had last year. On the contrary, we know that we will actually have very favorable base effects. But we have to look through that. We have to look at underlying inflation dynamics. And one of the sort of most readily available gauges is core inflation. And core inflation shows no signs of abating. It has picked up another 20 basis points in, uh, in December. And I would first need to see a different dynamics in core inflation before I could start thinking about a sort of more equal balance of risk and the risks of doing too little versus the risks of us doing too much. At this, side, at this moment, we're only focused of the, on the risk of doing too little. The risk of doing too much will, of course, enter into the equation later in the year. When in the year? Again, I cannot say. There's too much uncertainty for that. But I do think that at least until mid-year, we will be in tightening mode. Class, we spent the entire interview looking at domestic factors within the EU, and rightly so. I mean, this is very important to ask a, a policymaker like yourself uh, these issues. But external factors, we don't operate in a vacuum here in Europe. What are the biggest external factors that you are observing at the moment? I mean, we know we've got the war, we've got the China yeah. reopening, we've got concerns about the relationship between the US and, and China. I just wonder... Which need to pay attention to this. Well, your summary already covers the ground <laughs> okay. quite well, I would say. No, we have a brutal an unjustifiable war on the European continent. Of course, that's an, a continuous source of uh, uncertainty. We don't know how the war will develop. 
Secondly, yes, the reopening of China. That will mean also that China will probably start to compete for uh, uh, LNG, liquid natural gas. What that will do on gas prices, I think, is also an uncertainty uh, that is still around. There's a lot of optimism on gas prices, but sometimes I can't help wondering whether that has to do with a, a bit of a sort of warm winter. That's why you wouldn't say it today, <laughs> but outside today you would say so. So there is genuine uncertainty still about these factors going into uh, 2023. And on that China reopening, what's your tendency or your view? Do you believe there will be an inflationary impulse from the reopening or is China going to begin exporting deflation again? It's very hard to say. It, it, it will depend on how the Chinese population uh, will respond. We know, of course, from our own experiences that reopening is not just a matter of removing lockdowns. It's also a matter of providing enough comfort to the citizens themselves that they can actually go out. And if there is still a lot of COVID around, it leads to some form of restraint that we've also seen in our societies. So, but yes, if China is going to reopen, it's going to compete again on, uh, on international markets for some of the so goods like energy that we also uh, need. So in the, in the first instances, I would expect an upward impact on inflation and not per se a, a deflationary impact. What a great chat, class. I, I thoroughly enjoy speaking to you today. So thank you so much indeed for joining us. Um, we'll catch up on another occasion, I know. But Klaas Knott, who is the president of the Netherlands uh, Central Bank as well. A plenty